Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of For the Love of Film, the series where I talk to a variety of different people about film and their love of film and how they got into film in the first place. And today I'm joined by Corey. Corey, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Corey Doyle. I run a YouTube channel formerly known as Corey's Reviews, which I've since changed to Corey Doyle. And it's a channel that I used to be using for movie reviews, and it's largely still what I'm doing on my channel, but I'm still kind of going through a lot of changes regarding what I want to do with my channel. I haven't uploaded in like six months because I've gone through a massive existential crisis regarding my YouTube channel, <laughs> and I haven't told anyone who follows my channel about it yet, but... <laughs> I primarily review and talk about movies on my channel. That's why I started YouTube in the first place, and it's still the focus of my channel. And for context, anybody watching, um, so I started my channel in about 2015, uh, so I've been doing it for eight years. I think, Corey, you started yours around about the same point. And out of all the people I've known through YouTube, Corey was the first person that I've you're you're basically the first friend I've made through YouTube, and we've been in contact since about 2016. I think I think it was late yeah. 2016. Yeah, like I started, right. I started a channel called Supersonic Corey that I started way back in August 5th, 2014. So Ooh. around the time the original Five Nights at Freddy's came out, Ooh. and then that lasted until early 2016. Um, and then it kind of was going in a direction that I wasn't satisfied with. So I stopped making videos on that channel and I've since moved onto my current channel, which yeah. I've been trying to build ever since. And neglected. <laughs> and neglected. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Like you're under the radar videos. Yeah. I, I, the, I can't remember the last time I did one. It was, I want to say 2020. Yeah, no, it was for the Empty Man, wasn't it? It was. Um, I think it was for the Empty Man. Yeah. But yeah, I've been making videos since 2016, mm -hmm. and I make one between my six month long hiatuses. <laughs> and I don't bother to update up under the radar because I just. I, I, I mean, now that For the Love of Film has happened, I've got more important things going on. Uh, I thought a lot of films just make another one already. <laughs> So I, I'm, just... I'm surprised that no one's made that joke yet. That that no one's made, but a love of film. Considering <laughs> that's all I can hear whenever you read that title. Oh, for the love of film! <laughs> I mean, now that you've made the joke, someone's probably going to pick it up in like several episodes' time and then make make the joke again. Um, so to start things off, I just want to get a general gist. Um, of what is the most recent film you've seen that you absolutely loved? It can be a new release or an old release. Just what is the most recent film that you've seen that has blown you away? Um, that question is a little bit hard to answer because, like, I wrote down like since you gave me the these questions in advance, I Ooh. wrote down three movies because I just couldn't pick one. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but. Uh, two of them were new releases, um, mm. those being Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, mm. because that's just one of the best animated movies I've seen in a really long time. Um, I also saw Puss in Boots 2, um, The Last Wish, mm -hmm. and most recently I saw Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, because if anyone watches my channel, then they would know that I am a huge fan of the Mission Impossible movies. They're... Mm one of my favorite franchises of all time so i naturally loved dead reckoning because i love all of the mission movies except the second one <laughs> we don't talk about that one <laughs> despite its australia representation mm. um <laughs> we just kind of forget that last... one exists yeah uh, so do i um the last wish is one that i only saw fairly recently because i kept putting off watching it because yeah. i liked the like it's it's funny oh. because when the original first came out i was like 10 or 11 years old and i loved it at the time oh. like i loved it more than any of the shrek movies and due to the way the movie ended it implied that puss and kitty soft paws were going to get back together 
for the sequel. Like it felt like it was Ooh. setting up for a sequel. So I naturally really wanted it. And then years <laughs> went by and we never got it. And Ooh. so I just kind of lost interest. And then suddenly the trailer for the second movie hit cinemas. And I'm yeah. like, really? Now they're making a <laughs> sequel? And at that time, I just didn't care. <laughs> And then it got absolutely astonishing reviews. And I'm like, really? The first one wasn't really that good to begin with. Mm. But then I rented it and I realized, oh my God, it actually is as good as everyone says it is. And so I bought the Blu-ray like a couple of days later because it was just that good. Damn. And um, Across the Spider-Verse was excellent largely because I loved the animation. I thought the animation was absolutely stellar. Mm. I don't think I ever said this on my channel, but I have never been a huge fan of the original Into the Spider-Verse movie. I mm. like it. I think it's a good movie, but I couldn't mm. emotionally connect with it the same way everybody else did. So I just mm. thought it was good. Yeah. Across the Spider-Verse, I got it. And the main reason that really pulled that one through for me was the family drama and the dynamic between Miles and his parents and Gwen yeah. Stacy and her parents, her, her father. Yeah. Mother's out of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, Across the Spider-Verse almost made me cry within Ooh. the first 10 minutes with that scene. If you've seen the movie, you know the scene yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah. Um. And also, I just thought it brought up a really interesting moral dilemma. Does mm. the need of the many outweigh the need of the few? Mm. The only major thing I'm not sure if I loved about Across the Spider-Verse was yeah. the decision to make 2099 a villain. Because yeah. I've been waiting for a Spider-Man 2099 movie mm. for years and years. And we get a taste of it in the end credit scene of Into the Spider-Verse. Yeah. And then when he finally becomes one of the main characters, yeah. they make him an antagonist. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, I get why they did it. And at a narrative and storytelling standpoint, it mm. works. Yeah, But I kind of hope that he becomes a good guy for the second Beyond the yeah. Spider-Verse. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, those, those are three really good choices. I still need to see um, Puss in Boots too. I, I have seen the first one, and it, similar to you, I, I was like, by the time the sequel actually came out, I was like, I've kind of forgotten about the first one already. <laughs> um, but um, most people have. <laughs> yeah, it's. I also find it interesting that there aren't many examples that come to mind, but I do find it fascinating when a film comes out. And it's like average or not particularly great. And then a sequel comes out and it's like miles better in every single way. And I'm just like, why can't you do that with the first one? <laughs> I know, like it's, I absolutely agree with you. I can't really think of many movies where Ooh. the first one is just kind of average, yeah. but then the sequel is incredible. Mm. Like the closest I can think of is how... Mad Max was kind mm -hmm. of a thing yeah. or the original um, Road Warrior I think the second one is called and yeah. Beyond Thunderdome and everyone's mm. like yeah Mad Max they're pretty good movies oh my god Fury Road <laughs> I, everyone went nuts over it I, I will admit I am very much in, in that same ballpark like I don't mind the original trilogy it's just they don't really do anything for me and then Fury I Road happened. Seen them. like I, I think the only one out of the original three I've not seen is Thunderdome. But the first two, I'm like, they're dated, they're fine for what they were, but I'm not in a rush to rewatch them. Where Fury Road just kind of. I mean, every single aspect of that film I still think about to this day, and it came out in 2015. I think it was one of the first films I ever reviewed on my channel. And I still think it was about one it. of the first. You started with a lot of the 2015 movies like yeah. Mad Max, The Force Awakens, and you yeah. did a couple of 2014 movies as well, like yeah. Whiplash. Yeah. Which um, I, I'm not I think happy with those old reviews. <laughs> I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you because those videos came out almost 
mm. 10 years ago and absolutely nothing changes in no. 10 years. <laughs> nope, don't know what you're about. Yep. <laughs> um, it's, funnily enough, that actually beautifully segues into the second question, which is what initially got you into YouTube in the first place and wanting to do a channel of your own? Uh, and how do you approach making videos whenever you do make one? I guess that's two questions in one. Yeah. Um, to answer your first one, um, what first got me into YouTube was um, the fact that I saw another YouTube channel kind of reviewing movies. Mm. His name is um, Samuel Gavin, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, or Sam's channel. He is quite mm. obscure and very, very niche. And yep. he too has switched channels, which makes him a lot harder to find nowadays. Mm. But at the time, he was widely known for doing very geeky comic book related reviews. So he would review stuff like Star Wars or yep. Spider-Man or Man of Steel. And I especially was captivated by his Spider-Man reviews. Like I remember seeing his reviews for the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy in the thumbnail. Mm. And in his thumbnails had Sam's review or whatever and mistook it for him talking about Sam Raimi. <laughs> And so I started watching his reviews and hearing mm. how much he loved Spider-Man 2 or how much he was disappointed by Spider-Man 3. And mm. I was like, I really liked Spider-Man 3. Mm. And I saw on YouTube, nobody else liked Spider-Man 3. <laughs> and so I was like, I wanted to make a video mm. where I would defend Spider-Man 3. And so... And upon other videos, like, I really resonated with his review for The Spectacular Spider-Man, because yeah. at the time, no one was talking about it. Mm. And so I made a channel to specifically start talking about movies, because I, um, I basically realized, wow, this guy is sharing his opinion to the world, and I kind of wanted mm. my opinion to be heard. So I thought it would be fun to share my opinion with other people when I was 13 years old <laughs> and my critical thinking skills were still developing. <laughs> so like yours, um, mm. my early reviews were not good. Like my review, the very first review I ever did was for the Lego movie mm. and it has not <clears throat> aged well. <laughs> and ironically, it took me months or years to make the videos I actually started YouTube for. Like yeah. I started YouTube to review the spectacular spider-man yeah i still have not made that video yet <laughs> I you'll, you'll get there eventually you'll get there eventually eventually i'm just really really good at procrastination mm. <laughs> I, I could relate to that um especially with uh with youtube videos not so much but with when it comes to like writing short film scripts i the, i'm the worst for procrastinating i just um <laughs> For me, procrastination is at its worst mm. with my YouTube channel, which anyone who's seen my upload schedule will know. Mm. Why do I go six months without making YouTube videos? Procrastination. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and how do you approach making the videos? Because even though your channel is focused on film, uh, some of your most recent uploads um, start to veer in other directions so how do you approach making videos no matter what type they might be yeah um i think one of the reasons is like my said my pre-mentioned existential mm. crisis played a huge role into it mm. because lately i've come to really um doubt my critical thinking skills mm. for example there are many many movies or shows that i initially set out to review mm. one of my biggest examples is arcane which was mm. a bloody masterpiece i mm. wanted to say that on youtube for a really long time so i'll say it here arcane was fantastic i know next to nothing about league of legends <laughs> outside of the title i just know that mm. it's up there with dead by daylight as one of the most toxic gaming communities like i <laughs> told a friend of mine who plays league of legends going arcane was amazing i might actually play the game and my friend who plays league of legends was like don't don't play the game. <laughs> no, no 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 back away, back away. <laughs> uh, and i loved the show so naturally i wanted to make a review for it mm. so i sat down 
open a Word document or Google Docs, oh. and I just stared at the blinking cursor, <laughs> which I think is something we can all relate to. Yep. And I realized that I couldn't articulate into words how I mm. felt about yeah. that show. Mm. And so I had that realization going, if I myself don't know how I feel about something, why am I trying to make a video where yeah. I talk about how I feel about something? <laughs> and so I just gave up. Mm. And so I stopped working on that video. And mm. this is not an isolated incident. Like it's yeah. why I didn't review movies like Avengers Endgame. Because I'm like, it was such a great conclusion, but I'm not sure how I feel about the time travel element. And I yeah. just couldn't put it into words. And by the time I finally nailed how I felt about it, yeah. the movie was two years old. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> is there any point in reviewing it anymore? It's why I didn't review The Last Jedi. Mm. And there are videos where I almost finished editing it. Yeah. But I stopped making it because I just wasn't satisfied with what I mm. said about it. I was just going to say, to be honest, what you're describing is pretty much half the reason why I changed my style up on my YouTube channel in the first place. Because doing regular reviews of new stuff and the majority of stuff you watch is just meh or average, you only, there's only so much you can say about said thing before it gets really repetitive and you're just repeating yourself every episode. So, I completely get where you're coming from in that sense, because if I wouldn't have changed my style up into the format I have now, where I just talk about whatever I want, whenever I want, it f works better for me, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, it makes sense that you say that, because the mentality that I kind of have with my channel is that I am very much a quality over quantity to my channel, mm. which is one of the reasons why it's not growing. It's kind of detrimental how much i'm quality over quantity like i'm one of those people where if i'm going to make a video mm. i want it to be a video that you can come back to and watch multiple times like yeah. the entertainment value is just as if not in some ways more important than my commentary mm. like i like getting my opinion out there but it's why i crack so many jokes in yeah. my videos because that's why i make videos and whenever i make a really generic 10 minute review over the last most recent movie i watched yeah they just feel the most generic or yeah. unrewatchable videos like my least favorite video i've done in a long time mm. is my most recent review for lightyear mm. largely because it was just a video where i was kind of going through the emotions and i did it just to get a video out yeah it doesn't help that my opinion on the movie completely changed since I made that video because <laughs> like a month went by and I'm like, I don't agree with anything I said in that video because I think Lightyear was a huge wasted opportunity mm. and the movie I wanted Lightyear to be was not, is a was very not. different movie to the movie we got. Yeah. But... I made the mistake of shooting that video right after I'd seen it. Mm. So it had been an hour since I'd seen it when I shot the video. So I was still hyped from having been to the cinema to see yeah. it, which I think clouded my judgment. It happens every single time I shoot a video right after I've seen the movie I'm reviewing. Mm. So I need to give a movie sometimes days weeks months and sometimes even years like yeah. endgame or the last jedi yeah to really understand how i feel about it mm. which is one of the reasons i've stopped doing movie reviews these days i kind of don't make a video on a movie i've seen yeah unless i know exactly what i'm going to say about it mm. or if it's something where it can lead to a really entertaining video. Mm. For example, there's a video that's kind of in the works where it's going to be a review for Speed Racer. Mm. Not only because I hold an opinion of that movie that not many people have, that mm. it's extremely underrated, mm. but also there's just a golden platter of opportunities to poke fun at it. And so... Yep. <laughs> It's going to be extremely time consuming. It's going to be a big video, yeah. which is why I haven't made it yet because procrastination. 
Yep. <laughs> but I like to think that once that video is done, it will be worth it. And mm. it's a video you can come back to rather yep. than my generic review of like the Mitchells versus the machines, a mm. review where I feel like I did not do that movie justice. Mm. Like what I said about it in my review doesn't <clears throat> hold up to how good the movie actually was. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons why I started branching out because mm. since I have this mentality with movie reviews, yeah, I kind of feel like I need something to fill up the space mm -hmm. with my channel. Yeah. So that's where I'm thinking about kind of doing more stuff that's related to music. And mm. I very recently came up with the idea of talking about books on my channel, mm. kind of like Daniel Green, a YouTube channel that I discovered when yep. I found out he loves roasting other people's bookshelves. <laughs> <laughs> um, like he's by far my favorite booktuber. Yeah. And one of the reasons why books is something I've been spending a lot of time sort of investing into Mm. is because I am currently writing a book, mm. which is the other reason I haven't <laughs> uploaded in like six months, <clears throat> because writing a book is one of the mm. hardest things I've ever done in my life. But I love mm. storytelling and it mm. just feels like something I'm meant to do with my life. Yeah. And so when it comes to my channel, probably going forward, yeah, I am might even start sharing my experiences with the pros and cons and kind of the highs and lows and the things that I'm kind of struggling with and things I'm learning from my experience of being autistic, yeah. but also being an aspiring author yeah. because I'm writing this book with the intention of getting it published. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think... Um... Like, it, it's a tricky one because like I've seen, I see so many different people on YouTube saying if you want your YouTube channel to do well, you've got to make it like a, you know specific to a niche demographic, hence like film for example or music. But I I actually quite I prefer it when someone actually tries different things, and I think because I know uh, you've already posted a couple of drum covers on your channel already. Yeah, like my uh, last video was my drum cover for Living on a Prayer by Bon yeah. Jovi, which is a video I'm really proud of, and mm. I'm annoyed that I haven't done more of them. Mm. And I think stuff like that, even if it's like slowly drip feeding new types of stuff that isn't film related, even if it's just that, I like channels that try variety every now and then. And I think, especially considering you've got the book, you've got the music, you've got the film aspect, I think there's, I, I like the idea of what you could possibly do with that on your channel. And there are definitely yeah. ways you can bleed them into each other. Like, for example, you said you thought about doing a series where you compare the book to the film adaptation and stuff like that. Or there's even ways you could lead the music aspect into film as well there's so many ways you could handle it and i i i think considering the fact that you've been on a bit of a hiatus for about six months i'm looking forward to seeing what you eventually do with those different avenues if that makes sense yeah because like with the music, I have been spending so much time working on music projects, mm. like doing a full band cover of Toxicity by System of a Down. Mm. And I finish it and I get really, really excited about it. Mm. And then I just don't share it <laughs> because I can't sing it. Mm. Um, I'm not a very confident singer. And so I just haven't mm. started sharing my music yet, even though I'm happy with everything else with the cover. Yeah but it kind of feels weird. I think I might need to be content with just posting instrumental covers yeah. until I can get confident with my singing. I'm hoping I can sort of let that bleed into my channel a little bit. Mm. So one day I might do, I still want to talk about movies on my yeah. channel. Yeah. For example, one of my big ambitious videos that I want to make is that since Saw 10 is coming mm. out in just a couple of weeks, Mm. I want to make a video where I talk about every single Saw movie, mm. either in the order of how I'd rank them or in chronological order. Yeah. And give my thoughts on each individual movie in one massive long video. And it could be yeah. up to like 
I don't know, maybe three hours long, depending on how in-depth they go in each movie. Yeah. And those are kind of the movie-related videos I aspire to make because I think stuff like that Mm. is way more interesting than just a random 10-minute review for the sake of it. Yeah. And I, 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 I definitely think as well, especially in the case of your videos, I think going off of what you were saying earlier, I think those videos where you put more and this applies to my channel and other people's channels as well but the videos where you the more effort's been put in and they're more rewatchable i think end up being better because of it because i personally think some of your best videos are the very long ones that i agree i agree with that the, the ones that either delve really deeply into a film or just take the piss out of it like with cool cat saves the kids which i still <laughs> think i it's mean they're, still they're... one of my favorite videos i've made i mean there, there's a couple of videos of yours in contention for the funniest you've done you, there's a nice but ba- <laughs> i feel like you hit a nice balance of reviewing it taking the piss out of it and i think those sort of videos especially for the ones you because <clears throat> in my on my channel even when i did just regular reviews or even the stuff i do now i don't i don't script most of my videos hardly ever. i do um i, I can't relate sorry <laughs> i i have to script my videos um but I, I i mean i used to try scripting but i just couldn't get along with it um but when it comes to like humor and comedy i try to inject as much of my personality into it which if a comedic moment comes from that then fine because a lot of the funniest moments from my channel at least ones that you find really funny because i know there's were improvised yeah that a lot of them are improvised like even like when i reviewed incredibles 2 i still think quite highly of that video Mm. not because of what i said but because i realized how many times i accidentally described the movie as incredibly insert compliment (laughs) and so i realized i was Mm. making that unintentional pun yeah by a complete accident and so i just turned it into a running gag on the fly while i was (laughs) filming it um so going off of everything we've just spoken about um would you say that your mindset towards film has changed uh, as well as your taste in film as well Oh god, yes, absolutely. My opinion has definitely changed, which I think is what everyone you've asked that has said. I don't think you've done an episode so far where somebody said, oh no, my opinions have remained exactly the same. I need to change Uh, my questions. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, My opinions on, or like my taste in movies have exponentially changed, especially Mm. over the last couple of years. Yeah, And surprisingly, I don't think it was my YouTube channel that's been doing it. It's just because I've been getting older and I've been developing better critical thinking skills. Yeah, But when I first started doing YouTube videos, all I ever wanted to watch was action movies or animated movies. And that was pretty much it. If it wasn't Ooh. Disney or Pixar or if it wasn't Mission Impossible, <laughs> I had pretty much no interest in watching it. And yeah. so... Over the last few years, I've really been trying to challenge myself to watch movies in genres that I would be, I wouldn't have been as interested in, which is why lately I've recently kind of dabbled into horror movies. And Mm. even now I still, like, I'm very, very picky with what horror movies I like and don't like. Yeah. But... Things like the, I, when I started doing YouTube, I thought about making a video where I would talk about the kind of movies I would never, ever cover on YouTube. Mm. And it was one at the top of the list was going to be anything horror related. (laughs) And now one of my favorite videos that I have recently done Mm. is when I did a video on my top 10 favorite horror movies. Yeah. (laughs) And so that has obviously changed. I like, Five years ago, I never would have watched any of the Mm. Saw movies, but now I can't get enough of them. Mm. Um, But I feel like that my opinion has really, really matured lately. Like, I really try to branch out with other stuff I watch, which is why some dramas like Whiplash are also some of my all-time favorites. Mm. Yeah. No, I I think it's nice to, and like I said earlier, I I need to start thinking of new questions. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, 
but uh, it's it's nice to have that developing taste because I mean there are quite a few films I look back on when I was a kid and I'm like what was I thinking that film is not particularly great now and I like having that and I, this goes for anybody like I like having that developing taste because if you had spoken to me at secondary school I wouldn't have really thought twice about like foreign language films and now I go out of my way to watch as many like foreign language films in any genre possible and again it's just a case of like you with horror it's just a case of trying to find that right time and you know to step forward and go I'm gonna veer out of my comfort zone into this and then horror will lead to another genre and it's just about slowly getting used to each different types like I'm still not a massive fan of stereotypical period dramas but I know if I probably ro- watch the right one at some point it would then suddenly click. I also still need to work on get better with foreign films. I mm. hold the very very controversial opinion that especially with things like anime or foreign films, yeah. I prefer dubbed over subbed. And that is <laughs> not a popular opinion largely uh... because Mm. One of the reasons I watch movies is to get away from having to constantly read because yeah. whenever I'm watching something, I'm a slow reader. And so I'm just distra- I'm distracted mm. by this tiny writing that's happening at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. And I feel like I'm missing everything that's happening up here. Yeah. It... Especially if I or I have to pause it so I can <clears throat> read each line and yeah. it completely takes me out of it i have train to busan on blu-ray and i love the movie but i haven't re-watched it much because i have to be in the mood to read the subtitles while i'm watching it because there isn't a dubbed version on my blu-ray it's just subbed it it, subtitles is something i mean it, it it's something you kind of get used to over time because you I'm now at a point where you kind of have this natural kind of instinct to kind of dart to the thing, dart to the subtitles, read them, and then see what's happening. And I think what helps is the type of foreign films. If you find the right ones, they're easier to kind of know how to balance when to watch the screen and then read the subtitles. But it's definitely an art form that a lot of people, I know some people have trouble with, but it... When you do get the gist of it, it opens up so many different brilliant films. Because in my humble opinion, I think some of the best films being made full stop are not even in the English language, like Parasite or Burning, or I'm trying to think of other films, but I've blanked. But to, pr- to prove my point, I, I, I love foreign films. <laughs> and Train to yeah. Busan is a brilliant one. It is an excellent movie, and sometimes it's good to maybe try to convince me to watch the subbed version, mm. depending on the quality of the dubbed version. Yeah. For example, I'm currently watching through Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, mm. which is dubbed, and it's excellent. Like, the mm. dubbing for that show is fantastic. Mm. But I regret watching the dubbed version of Squid Game. <laughs> the dubbed version is not good. Well, on the other end of the spectrum, now that we've talked about how your taste has evolved, I want to take it back right to the start. If you can remember, um, what was the first film or any of the first couple films that really sparked your love for cinema in the first place? Probably Coraline. I talked. I told this story in my evolution on my channel video that I did over a year mm. ago, so I won't go too deep into it. If you want to yeah. know more, just go watch that. Yes, I'm shamelessly plugging my channel. (laughs) Um, But when I was a young teenager, I ran into Coraline on TV and I was an absolute coward at the time. And so I kept leaving the room whenever things got mildly creepy. Mm. And so I only watched like half of the movie in discombobulated fragments. And I drew the conclusion that this movie is way too scary for kids. It should not be PG. And therefore, it's a shit movie. And that was going to be my first review I ever made. I was just going to completely dismiss Coraline because it was Mm. too scary. Um, But then I was, for some reason, really fascinated 
by it and Ooh. I started watching the behind the scenes because I said something in a very passive aggressive tone I give it huge respect for it being a stop motion movie because <laughs> the filmmakers must have worked really hard on it yeah and that really stuck with me mm. and so I started doing the behind the scenes and I went oh my god they worked really hard on it mm. and I just had a deep appreciation for how much effort went into the stop motion mm. I grew to appreciate the art direction and the style yeah. and the batshit insane storytelling. <laughs> um, and so I decided to give the movie another chance. And mm. then I absolutely loved it. And it's now one of my favorite movies of all time. Mm. And so when I was in middle school, I loved the movie so much that I wrote my very first review and mm. so I structured it like it, I opened by describing what the movie was about. I went by category by category. And it was kind of the catalyst for what eventually became my YouTube channel. Yeah. Because I reviewed Coraline in a much more positive light. Mm. And that was kind of the movie where I had a much deeper appreciation for how movies mm. are made and they're made <clears throat> by people. Yeah. And that's when I started to view not just Coraline, but other movies in a more positive lens. And yeah. that's kind of the movie that did it for me. By far, it's definitely mm. Coraline. Yeah. To be honest, if there's going to be any film that sparks your love for cinema, Coraline's a brilliant one to to have be that catalyst. Because it, similar to you, it is one of my favourite, at least animated films. It's definitely in like my top 100 uh, favorite films of all time but um i think coraline, coraline was one of the movies i recommended to you like i saw it yeah. years before you did and i was the one who kept hounding on you going dude you need to see coraline you need yeah. to see coraline you're like i'll get to it and then you did and you're like oh my god you were right it was so good and i'm like i told you <laughs> yeah I, I i know when i eventually told some of my mates that i'd seen it they were like you know that came out in 2009 you're very late to the party and i'm like i know it just took me a while okay um one thing i wanted to touch on because you mentioned earlier that um you're on the autistic spectrum and for those of you that don't know i am as well i have uh asperger's which isn't massively on the spectrum but it is one of the many different um areas I guess that's the word I'm going to go with. <laughs> um, it's one a of the... very, very wide spectrum. Yeah, like you you could spend hours talking about how big and varied the spectrum actually is. Um, but going off of that, and again, because of both of our love of film, I was interested to ask that what is your opinion on just general autistic representation in film? And what do you think some good or bad examples are? This is definitely one of the heaviest hitting questions I think you've um, asked in this interview because due to being on the spectrum myself, I have very, very strong feelings about it. And yeah. I'll try not to go into too much detail because if I do, this episode is going to be three hours long. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be here a while. <laughs> yeah, we will be here for a while if I go too heavy into it. Um, I definitely think autism representation can be a lot better because I've yeah. noticed I haven't seen too much of it. There are examples, mm. both good and bad, that I yeah. need to see. Mm. But I realize that not many versions of representation are very good because mm. I've noticed there seems to be a common trend, like two yeah. negative common trends when it comes to autism representation. Either it's incredibly insulting and yeah. it makes us look like complete idiots or completely clueless yeah or like i'm trying to find out the most sensitive way of putting it but yeah, they're fine. basic very they're very very distasteful yeah i think the best example i can think of at the top of my head is music by yeah. sia yeah. which is a movie i absolutely loathe and considering how sia acted to reacted to the backlash because yeah. everybody else was insulted by it because it's not an accurate portrayal of most people who have autism. Yeah. Some people might think it's accurate, but 
Yeah. Definitely not the majority. And the way she reacted, yeah. I honestly can't stomach see her anymore. Like yeah. I used to like some of her music, like Chandelier, I thought yeah. it was a beautiful song. Yeah. And I can't listen to it anymore. Uh, I'm in the exact same boat because I think we both became aware of the film around about the same time and you watched it before I did. And then when I eventually watched it, we both pretty much said the same thing. It's just like, it, it, it handles it in the most backwards way possible and unfortunately presents it as gospel, which is not think... the case. What makes it so much worse is that um, Sia's music is not only insulting, but yeah. it's outright dangerous yeah. because it is teaching people on how to yeah. react to meltdowns. <clears throat> like it's trying to teach yeah. neurotypical people how to respond when a neurodivergent person is having a meltdown. Yeah. Now, this is kind of outside my area of expertise because despite the fact that I'm level two on the autism spectrum, mm. I personally don't have me meltdowns or at yeah. least not the kind that is portrayed in the movie. Yeah. However, I can say with confidence, and I think mm. pretty much anyone on the spectrum will tell you this, that if they are having a meltdown, yeah. the last thing you should do is what they do in music yeah. and have them <laughs> restraining you and pinning you to the down like you're yeah. the FBI being caught <laughs> for smuggling drugs or something. Yeah. FBI opened up! <laughs> um, what, because, think... like, uh... I've heard stories where people who have been restrained like that the way that they done in the movie, yeah. and then with all, all the whimsical music and being put yeah. in a much positive light and the fact that it happens twice in the movie, mm. like, it's a scene that has triggered so many people and it's yeah. brought back ma many many traumatizing memories of their past yeah and i've heard that apparently incidents like that in the real world have gotten people on the spectrum killed mm. because they suffocated them or they broke yeah. their ribs or mm. something to that end and mm. that's what c is teaching you to do basically like i i hate that movie with all my passion yeah it's, However, uh, and I'll let you finish. No, I was just gonna. I was just pretty much gonna confirm everything you said because the film presents it in a way of like that is what you need to do. This is the right way to do it. This is what I you am must crushing do. her with my yeah. love. And and like especially from our perspective, we're just watching it going, no, that's not what you do. That's the opposite of what you should be doing. And even. From a filmmaking perspective, there's many things wrong with how the film is approached when it comes to autism. For example, you have these, it's a normal drama with these like very bright and very like vibrant musical the moments. music video sections? Yeah, which are just scattered throughout the film, which I think for some highly autistic people might be a sensory overload which it has then, been there i've seen reviews yeah. where people on the spectrum have outright said they had to skip those scenes or stop yeah. watching it because it was too <laughs> overly stimulating yeah it's just like i'm going to make a film about autistic representation and make sure it's properly you know put on film and then you have scenes like that which are like an autistic person's worst nightmare at least for people yeah. that are extreme on the spectrum and i think the worst aspect for me outside of the stuff you mentioned is the the main actress maddie ziegler again nothing against her but i think the thing that grated me the most was her main method of research for the film and getting in the mindset of an autistic person was to watch autistic mental breakdown videos and that's most of the research she did. And I'm like, no, actually, yeah, look into it. Go to a library, talk to an autistic person, get first hand experience. I was going experience. to say, yeah, get first hand no experience. You can talk, right? Yeah, just not oh, just... Google, don't just Google or type into YouTube autistic person having a breakdown and have that be your method of research to get into Especially... character especially since the way autism affects you as a child yeah. has a significant difference to how it affects you as an adult. Yeah. Um, like, 
I think, and also there's other things that really annoy me, like the fact, like, mm. we're all going to ignore the fact that the reason why the first meltdown happened in the first place yeah. was because the main character was being a bitch and yep. ripped off her headphones. <laughs> yeah. Which, no wonder, look, what did you think was going to happen? <laughs> Just, I, I hate that movie so much. Okay. It, I mean, to, 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 to give us both a bit of breathing room, what is a, a bit of representation that you've seen or you've heard of that is actually somewhat respectful or realistic? The annoying thing is that I still haven't seen that many, so I haven't yeah. really seen any mm. great forms of representation where it's confirmed that the, the character is, in fact, on the spectrum. Yeah. Um. So I've started having head cannons. <laughs> um, for example, mm. I've brought up Speed Racer earlier in mm. this video, mm. but one personal headcanon that I have about Speed Racer is that I like to think that speed is on the spectrum mm. because throughout the entire movie, yeah. he comes across as a little bit socially awkward and yeah. he is absolutely hyper fixated on racing it's all mm. he talks about in pretty much the entire movie like throughout the entire movie yeah. all he can talk about is either racing yeah. or his family and trying mm. to protect them from greedy corrupt corrupt corporations like the royaltons yeah. mm. and also <clears throat> there are numerous times throughout the movie where he is so lost in his own world mm. that he what he sees doesn't really mesh with his real life surroundings like yeah. the scene at the beginning with the school yeah. where he's actually at school doing an exam that is boring him to tears but what mm. he sees is that he's pretending his desk is like a racing car yeah. and the whole school turns into a blur and it looks like a track mm. and i can relate to that i've mm. had experiences where I'm like carrying like a spatula while unloading the dishwasher, mm. but I can get so lost in my own own world that mm. it feels like I'm on Mustafa swinging a lightsaber when I'm actually swinging a spatula in the kitchen looking like an idiot. Mm. And then I realize that someone's watching me looking like an <laughs> idiot and I start masking immediately and just drop what I'm doing. But... Mm. He just shows all those signs that even though they never outright say that speed is on the spectrum in the movie, yeah. I like to think that he is. Okay. I, I find that interesting because I don't... There haven't been many times where I've watched something and I've had headcanon, but I more specifically look for films that try to represent it in some shape or form. Like I know a lot of people have headcanon that Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory... Is on the spectrum even though i'm pretty sure in the show it's never explicitly said but i think one of my per I, this is a film that i've recommended to you corey multiple times um is the imitation game because there has been some i don't i can't believe people have actually said this but there has been some debate that alan turing was actually on the spectrum even though real life accounts and in the film it's quite clear um, and I think it's probably one of the most respectful ones I've ever seen. I still it, need to see the imitation game. <laughs> it's, I mean, outside of being just a brilliant movie from front to back, it handles it in a way that doesn't demean the person of Alan Turing because of he, he was a genius at what he did. But it does it in a way that just kind of shows it in a manner of fact, like, not like we now. still struggle with it, but yeah. in a non, I think demeaning is the perfect way you can put it. Yeah. And that's kind of how I was trying to put it much earlier. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and it's interesting that I still need to watch the imitation game. Mm. So I can't really comment on that much, mm. but I was trying to decide whether or not I wanted to bring up Sheldon Cooper. So it's mm. interesting that you bring him up Yeah. <laughs> um, because I know a lot of people like to sit, um, say that he's on the spectrum Yeah. and I can kind of see why, but mm. I personally don't think he's a good example to point to for good autism representation yeah. for one very, very simple reason. Mm. 
Sheldon Cooper is a dick. <laughs> that he is. is a complete asshole. Yeah. I do not like him. He's and also there are little episodes where he misses sarcasm. Like I think there are mm. elements of good representation. For example, yeah. one of my favorite Sheldon moments is in the episode where he's trying to decide whether to get a PS4 or an Xbox One. And Mm. early on in the episode, he's talking about this dilemma to his girlfriend Mm. and getting into the really nitty gritty specifications about which one to get and the pros and cons of both. And the girlfriend just does not give a shit. (laughs) She could not care less. I think that's half the reason why... Um, and again, this is even more reason for you to specifically watch the imitation game. And for anyone who hasn't seen it, what are you doing? Watch the imitation game. I think I think that's half the reason why it is one of my favourites because it's it nails this typical things you would expect an autistic person to do, like jokes going over their head and social cues going over their head. But it also nails one specific aspect, which is the core of the film, which is that. To crack the Enigma code during World War II, Alan was forced to work with people and a group. But unfortunately, because he's dead set on this thing that he knows is going to crack said code, he ver- he isolates himself just to get on with the thing he knows will do the thing, even though everyone else is trying to work as a team and they're trying to include him, but he's so fixated with trying to solve it the way he wants to solve it because he knows that's the right way. And again, it doesn't do it in a way that's like very showy or is very, again, demeaning. It does it in a way where it's like he's obviously... It just exists, but it doesn't define his character. Yeah. and Which I think is how you do it at the end of the day. Like, um, I guess the final point that I kind of wanted to make before we move on is that Mm. at the start of the question, I said that there were two negative traits and i talked a lot about the first one about how it can be very very demeaning Mm. but i know that there are some examples of shows that have really really tried to be more progressive but they overcorrect it to the point where they start glorifying autism which is in my opinion just as bad yeah i think an excellent example is the good doctor yeah i do not like the good doctor Mm. and i will tell you why The main reason why I personally don't like The Good Doctor is that he is a savant, which savants do exist. There are people that are extremely spectacular in a very specific field, but it's not the majority. And it doesn't do a very efficient job at showing how debilitating having autism can be. Yeah. Like the most debilitating debilitating aspect of autism for him is a case of everybody just immediately judges him and dismisses him because he's autistic Mm. or that he's a little bit socially awkward. Yeah. Um, But especially in the first episode of the show, one thing aspect of the first episode that really rubs me the wrong way is that the people at the hospital didn't let him work at the hospital Mm. until it was convenient for them. Like they immediately dismissed him until he proved himself and then as soon as they realize that he can benefit them immediately they do a complete 180 and at that point it kind of felt like sean was being used Mm. at that point and that was just an aspect of the episode that never sat right with me Mm. and so like i don't hate the good doctor there are elements of it that are accurate there's elements of accuracy in there i would watch it over music any day but (laughs) i I don't like how it tries to glorify it i think another example of something that does it i haven't seen it myself but in the past you've talked about the most recent predator remake i think where there was a child who understood alien technology because he was autistic yeah. and uh, I haven't seen it. I'm just going no. by your description of it. It's not, but good. yeah, I, I've heard based on that, but the... I'm like, that's not how autism works. I, I totally agree with you that every now and then something like the good doctor or the predator will treat autism like a superpower. And it's like, like you said, 
that's not how it works there's more nuances to that and I, I think the main thing that pissed me off with the predator was just like even if the kid had autism or not, there's no way he's going to understand that alien language and work that device. Oh, wait, no, he did. How has he done that? With autism. Aut- yeah, because that's how autism. autism works. <laughs> Have that... you ever talked to somebody that's autistic? That's not how it works. <laughs> that, that's Hollywood's default thing. It's just like, right, we need a reason to get from point A to point B for this character. Because autism. And uh, that's just and... their reasoning. And nobody stopped to think that maybe that might piss some <laughs> neurotypical off people off. Like, yeah, that's just, um, I think personally, because there's so many poor yeah. representation, I've heard that there's some really great representation. I've heard Disney's our house is mm-hmm. excellent in that department. And I yeah. think gravity falls has good representation. I need to see those. Yeah. But personally, if it's not accurate or if it's really insulting because it's either <laughs> too demeaning or they're trying too hard to glorify it. Yeah. And when you're in either of those camps, which yeah. most of the representation I personally have seen have done one or the other, yeah, I would rather not be represented in fiction at all. I would rather have no representation than poor representation and most of the representation that i personally have seen yeah is not very good so just a general question that i'm curious to hear what answers you give um what's a popular slash classic film that you still haven't seen yet um i've got a couple of answers that i think are gonna piss some people off (laughs) but um since you gave me these questions in advance i wrote these down because i was not going to remember all of them (laughs) but some of the most popular (laughs) classic movies i haven't seen yet are involving but are not limited to the godfather Mm -hmm. fight club shawshank redemption and pulp fiction so the imdb top 250 (laughs) <laughs> pretty, much. pretty much like even like my sister gave me fight club and shawshank redemption on blu-ray for christmas last year and i'm like yeah. i got the message i need to see them and i still haven't seen them a similar question but the other end of the spectrum um and again i don't want you to repeat music here uh what is the worst film you have ever seen in your life okay i was going to jokingly start with music <laughs> but we were... <laughs> um i think that's beating a dead horse at this point um, it's already dead. <laughs> <laughs> Not dead enough. <laughs> anyway, but it's interesting approaching bad movies because I don't watch bad movies movies mm. very often because whenever I hear a movie is bad, I mm. usually don't watch it with the odd exception. And what makes a movie bad is really entirely depending. Like some of it, it's because the movie's just really, really poorly made. And some of it is just because it makes storytelling decisions I don't like. Yeah. And so um, which one of the two really, really depends. Yeah. But I wrote a small list of movies because they're bad in different (laughs) ways. Yeah. The first one is a really obscure movie that most people watching this probably have never heard of, but it's Mm. called My Ghost Dog. And it's extra like I, it's really old i think it's like came out in like the early 2000s or late 90s but it was yeah. incredibly low budget and i feel like it was at such a dirt cheap budget that, mm. that i think they could only afford like three locations for the entire movie <laughs> so in this hour and a half long movie oh, they God. go to the same pizza place like eight times <laughs> in the same movie <laughs> so every other scene it's like let's get pizza <laughs> and it's just <laughs> The acting is, it's, there's oh. one point where it tries to go all home alone and mm. set up booby traps yeah. for the teenagers that stole the file box, and it's just absolutely terrible. <laughs> there's um a movie I wrote down called Prince of the Nile, which okay. is kind of an Australian bootleg of DreamWorks Prince of Egypt. <laughs> okay. And as a really young child, for mm. some reason, because I had both movies on DVD. I had yeah. the original and the bootleg. Mm. And as a kid, I liked the bootleg more. Nice. And so when I watched it as an adult, I it's one of those movies where you mentioned much earlier in this video yeah. going, 
where you like it as a kid, but when you're watching an adult, you go, mm. what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> Prince of the Nile was one of those movies. Like, think of Prince of Egypt, yeah. but it's shit. There were um, Shark Tale I wrote down just mm. because the animation is deep, deep, deep into the Uncanny Valley. Yeah. Um, the Room. For obvious reasons. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, uh, you're the first person no to pre- mention the room, which I'm surprised. I'm sick. <laughs> this is the sixth episode, and you are the first person to mention the room, as far as I'm aware. And <laughs> that that alone surprises me. Those are all movies that I added just because they they're poorly made. They're bad. Yeah. But I saved two movies that are uh, have better production quality. Yeah. But um, I think are terrible for <laughs> because of how it was written. Yep. And those are um, A Good Day to Die Hard. Yep. And The Rise of Skywalker. Okay. Okay. Um, A Good Day to Die Hard because I feel like it just completely demolishes what makes Die Hard so great. Like, even in franchises with bad installments like mm. Terminator, I can still watch the bad ones and get mm. some enjoyment out of it. Like, I mm. like even Genesis or Rise of the Machines to some degree. Yeah. I cannot see myself watching A Good Day to Die Hard mm. ever again yeah. unless it was for a video or something because I hate it that much. Yeah. And The Rise of Skywalker is an absolute mess in terms yeah. of the screenwriting. So the second to last question that I like to ask everybody on this uh, series and... Again, like I say this every time, but I, I must stress it. The whole reason I love asking it is because I like seeing what different answers I get. And that kind of goes for the last two questions as well, but specifically with this one. And that is, if you were stand- stranded on a desert island and you only could choose five films to have with you, what are you choosing and why? This is by far the hardest question that... I had to answer like <laughs> when I agreed to do this. Yeah. This is the question that I have absolutely been dreading because <laughs> I cannot narrow it down to just five. You, you I see, tried so hard to narrow it down to five. See, I'm worrying the day when someone turns it back on me and asks me the question and I'll just be like, I'd put um his ten. <laughs> 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 yeah, because like like um because I wanted to especially prepare for this answer. Yeah. And I tried to narrow it down to five, but I wrote down eleven oh, movies. Christ. <laughs> like you so only I'm have five, gonna... goddammit. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um so I'm just gonna go rapid fire like the all the other movies I considered yeah. adding to the list, but okay. didn't make the cut because I could only choose five. But yeah. some of the movies I considered were Cube, Terminator 2, Mission Impossible, Fallout, Back to the Future, Die Hard, Inside Out, and Zootopia, which okay. are all of some of my absolute favorites. But I didn't add what well, I currently added to the list. Mm. Um, I tried to take the one genre, one movie per genre approach, which I know yeah. other people have done for yeah. theirs. Yeah. Um, but the first one was Coraline because. Yeah. Obviously, it's one of my favorite animated movies of all time. Mm. Um, the original Saw, because it's probably yeah. one of my favorite horror movies ever made. Um, Speed, because mm. the premise is just <clears throat> spectacular. Yeah. Um, Spider-Man 2, because it's my favorite superhero movie. Yeah. And Whiplash, because it's my favorite dra- uh, drama. Like, just yeah. one movie per genre. But mm. it's kind of representing my favorite in each of those genres. And yeah. like it sucks that I can only bring five because there's other movies I'm like, but what about <laughs> Shaun of the Dead? Or what about the entire mm. Cornetto trilogy? But for now, Coraline, Saw, Speed, Spider Man 2, and Whiplash would be the five movies that I would bring. I, I which I that. still think that I don't think anyone so far has given any of those movies as their answers like there still hasn't been any overlap maybe there's one no i think i think we're still i think we still got a clean slate now um yeah which is shocking because i am like i listed off like 11 12 movies or something and there's still no overlap yeah that's that's impressive i'm surprised no one's mentioned because 
with a question like that, I was bound someone would say, like, repeat. I was expecting Shawsh- some overlap. Yeah, like, I was expecting, like, Shawshank to be repeated somewhere, or Fight Club to be repeated somewhere, or one of the, you know, classics to be, like, repeated. I suppose some people have mentioned Lord of the Rings for two different questions. Um, so that's the like only... Like, the what's the most recent movie you've seen? And I yeah. know Oppenheimer came up a lot yeah. <laughs> but for this question they've all been wildly different options and yeah. choices not gonna lie when <coughs> first realizing i was going to have to answer this question yeah i initially thought about taking the piss out of the question and just going <laughs> with well cast away and then um we army man and just picking oh, movies about that. people being stranded on an <laughs> island um or just the longest movies ever made, like the extended <laughs> cut of Lord of the Rings or Gone with the Wind. Oh, God. Just so, because they're all like three or four hour long movies, so they last me a lot longer. Oh, but I love that. No, the, the original five that I mm. chose would be the movies I would actually choose. And I'm still mm. getting movies at the top of my head. I wish I could add yeah. to that list, like Jumanji. <laughs> yeah. But those four, five oh. are going to be mm. my choices. I, I love the picks you've... To be honest, I, there's not been a five so far that I've found, like, not necessarily a weak link, but, like, I, I've... Re- every, every episode I've done so far, when people have listed their five, I've been like, I completely understand why you've chosen them. Like, for example, with yours, Coraline and Saw specifically have a lot of, like, hidden details and rewatch value. Uh, especially Coraline, because I know I've seen some videos on like YouTube where there's like so many little hidden details that they put into the sets and stuff. That Hereditary I... would have also been a great choice for that mm. exact reason because yeah. it's just so rewatchable. I say that, and I've only seen it once, but yeah. <laughs> I need to change that. I need to watch it again <laughs> for that I... exact reason. Yeah. Plus, I think the inclusion of films like Speed and Spider Man Two kind of help break up like for example you've got two films like i said Coraline and saw where there's nice hidden details to keep you re-watching and keep you looking at different things but then speed and to an extent spider-man 2 are like they're fun action films and especially with speed because it is such a straightforward premise you can just get lost in those films a little bit because they're fun escapism action films um, yeah, and then and Whiplash like, ties that all together, yeah. being the serious, dramatic film with a lot of like themes going on. I think also, at least with the majority of the five you've picked, a lot of them are quotable as well. Like Whiplash oh, is very quotable. Extremely. Spider-Man 2 is very quotable. Saw, even to an extent, is quotable. Like There are lines from that film that are, are immediately coming to my head, even if they're not necessarily like as as famous as the not quite my tempo from whiplash okay last question i want to ask just out of curiosity and again feel free to just spitball any that come to mind um are there any films coming out recent uh soon or recently that you are looking forward to um i am tempted to say to say saw 10 yeah because that's a movie that i've been really excited for ever since it was announced honestly because i just love those movies Mm. however i'm also keeping in mind that at the time we're recording this the movie is going to be released like two weeks from now uh, from now so (laughs) there's a good chance that this is going to go up and the movie's already been released yeah but there there is a high potential that this this episode could come out around about the week after the movie does yeah yeah um but i've even googled to see what else is coming out towards the end of the year but mm. no, Saw's the really big one for me. That's yeah. probably going to be one of the next movies that I'm going to see mm. as soon as it comes out. Nice. I, I still need to watch some of the other Saw films because the only one I've seen is the first one. And I think half the It's reason... the best one by far. Oh, yeah. The others I mean... are just guilty pleasures for me. <laughs> I think half the reason I've been a bit um, hesitant to continue with the series is because you've said it yourself. It's a very convoluted series. Like... Oh God, yeah! Like it, you're gonna need to like get out a sheet of paper with um, <laughs> notepads and just scramble all the early. Okay, so this is a flashback and flashbacks within flashbacks, which has been told out of chronological order. And then there's tw- what twist that reveals that this person in this flashback was it's... there the whole time. Like it's 
Like that people uh, compare the Saw timeline to Lost for hmm. a reason. Yeah. Like it is the most convoluted timeline I've ever seen in any franchise in my life. Like it tried to dissect every single scene in hmm. chronological order of the whole series. Yeah. Will give you a migraine by the end of it. It's is it incredibly convoluted? Is it a bit like that gif of Charlie Day from Always Sunny in Philadelphia, where he's got oh, like, yeah, pins up on the board? And he's like, I... oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that absolutely. I would love to see like a twelve-hour-long cut of all mm. the movies combined in one massive file, but the scenes are all rearranged to show the Saw movies in chronological order anyway that we are now nearing the end of the episode now is the point where corey feel free to just let everyone know where they can find you on the internet (laughs) (laughs) um you won't because i upload that (laughs) infrequently (laughs) um Uh. all jokes aside is that um i'm currently running my youtube channel which is currently under the name corey doyle Mm. but if you put in Corey's reviews, you will also probably find me that way. And I mostly have a YouTube channel where I talk about movies. Mm. I occasionally review video games. And depending on whether or not I actually follow through with what I say I'm going to do, yeah. I'm going to be talking about books. I'm going to be talking about music. I'm going to be talking about video games, movies, all things that is just creativity and mm. media. Yeah. And so... If you liked what you saw from me in this video, go mm. watch my channel because it's more of that, basically. And Corey... whenever I'm oh, doing more than just, yeah, whenever mm. I'm uploading more than just six months apart, I need to get better <laughs> with that because the YouTube algorithm does not like it when I go on <laughs> multiple six months long hiatuses. My channel subscriber count is just dormant. And it's because I'm not uploading. The YouTube algorithm can't promote my videos if I give it no videos to promote. So I need to get better with that. And for context, Corey does have a Twitter and an Instagram. But I never use it. No, but never (laughs) uses it. So I will link the YouTube in the description below. And the Twitter and Instagram if you want to go and follow them. (laughs) Follow me on Twitter. I probably won't notice because I don't use those <laughs> accounts very much. Oh, dear. Or what's left of Twitter anyway. Yeah, sorry, sorry, X. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching another episode of For the Love of Film. Uh, Corey, it was great having you on. This is probably the funniest was, episode we've, we've had today. I was hoping it was. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> I was excited to do my episode of this the moment you announced it, you mm. announced it, like as soon as you told me you were going to do this, I'm like, oh my god, I can't wait to do mine. <laughs> so it's so exciting to finally do it. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me on your channel. It's no a huge honor. No worries. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm happy. I'm happy to have you on, and I, I say this every time on Twitter X, um, but uh, I'm always <laughs> looking for more people to have on this series. I've got a bit of a backlog at the moment of like seven or eight people that I need to get through first, but like it's if, become a waiting list at this yeah, point. It's like a doctor's waiting list at the moment and I will get to them. <laughs> but if it's anything like the GP surgeries in the UK, that waiting list might be several months. Yeah. If, if you do, if you are into film and you fancy being on the series in the future, let me know. I will add you to the ever growing list um and yeah i hope you enjoyed the episode and thank you all for watching and i will see you all in the next one bye see you later